Good morning, my friend. I hope you're doing well. It is Friday, 19 May, 2023. My voice is getting stronger. It's not back to normal. You hear me creaking a little bit. Um, and I'm going to bring you one more old episode. Um, just I don't have the stamina to do a whole because I've got five, yes, five interviews today. Um, a couple for my book, um, one for somebody else's podcast, and uh, three for my podcast. So it's it's going to be a day. Um, this afternoon after I get off of work, we're going to have several hours of using my voice. So, uh, over the next few days, you'll hear some new episodes and, um, super exciting stuff. I've got, um, three hope talks uh, that we're going to start the, the series called hope talks to get ready for the book launch for no, uh, for, um, hope is the first dose It's coming out in July. Um, and then I have an interview with an air force fighter pilot who's written an incredible book that's coming out on Tuesday that I'll bring to you on this coming Tuesday. Um, and then we're going to have a, talk with uh, one of our dear friends who's going to bring you some interesting information about hope and um, how to recover from massive things. And I'm just excited. Uh, I'm, I just decided, you know, it's time to go for it. I'm, I'm a croaky and not quite right, but I've got to get my voice back because I'm recording this audio book, Lord willing, um, week from Wednesday will be starting. So keep praying that my voice will be fully clear, no coughing, no trouble. Uh, and uh, we appreciate the prayers and the support there and uh, that we'll get through today. Uh, in the meantime, the the decision uh, that I'm bringing you this episode today is, is because the Air Force Fighter Pilots book is all about um, – decision making it's, it's about how to it's, it's in fact it's called the art of clear thinking uh, and it's about how to make good decisions under great stress and, and it's a tremendous book i just had an opportunity to read the advanced copy um over this past week and i'm, I'm super excited to get a talk to him today and bring that story to you but I've, I've written before and recorded before about uh, something called a hobson's choice and hobson's choices are these times in lives when we have to take something or leave it and lisa and i are in the midst of kind of a situation in our personal life that we're dealing with um, some big decisions that we're going to have to make uh, based on the behavior of other people and sometimes people put you in a box where you've got to make a choice and and it's good to have a strategy in fact the, the whole new book that i'm coming out with is about having a treatment plan when the massive thing comes it's good to have a strategy so you learn how to fall back on clear thinking on systems on planning on preparation remember our, uh, chris voss lesson that i brought to you many times before when the pressure's on you don't rise to the occasion you fall back to your highest level of preparation and one of those things you can prepare for is the response that you'll have when you're faced with the hobson's choice and what do you do then and so this is a good episode to remind us about how to think clearly in the midst of stressful situations and sometimes you have to take it or leave it and we're in kind of one of those situations now and you will be too there's many times in life when you're faced with these things and you can always remember that you can't change your life until you change your mind and the good news is you can start today so let's get after it hey my friend how are you last time i was having trouble sleeping i got some i got some uh ministering uh, from the holy spirit about some things we've been struggling with and i told you a couple of times now lisa and i've been dealing with a few things that are that are challenges for us um and and we're just working through some stuff and and God kind of gave me a message last night that I that I feel like I'm supposed to bring to you I, I didn't really have time to turn this into a normal episode it's not super polished I don't have tons of uh, scripture references or you know I certainly don't have a have it scripted out all the way but but uh, just some thoughts I'm probably going to ramble a little bit because when I don't have time to really prepare I tend to talk longer so forgive me for that but um, I'm going to start with this verse we talked about last time John 16:33 I've told you these things Jesus says I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in this world you will have trouble but take heart I have overcome the world now I told you before in my book uh, I've seen the interview I talked about it and in, in several of my previous podcasts we've talked about this notion of something called a Hobson's choice now Hobson's choice was uh, ref- is a reference to a guy named Hobson who owned a stable in Oxford England uh, back in the old days when everybody rode horses all, all over the place and the students on the weekends when they were out of school would come to Hobson and rent horses for the weekend and Hobson got tired of the best horses getting rented over and over and the not so great horses never getting rented so the best horses were getting worn out. So he made a policy decision in his stable that he was going to order the horses from front to back in the stable. And when you came in to rent a horse, you could rent the first horse in the stall or you could rent nothing. 
So it was basically like take it or leave it. That's that's where the phrase take it or leave it came from was Hobson gave people a choice, come to be known now as a Hobson's choice. It's you can have this or you can have nothing. You can take it or you can leave it. And we talked about that and I've seen the end of you, how life gives us a perfect example of a Hobson's choice. And Jesus, it's right here in John 16, 33. I want to give you peace, but you're going to have trouble. I want to give you peace, but you're going to have trouble. So you can take it or leave it. You can have the peace, but you're, but it's going to come with trouble, or you can have nothing. And he also said, I came here that you might have life and have it to the full. So the, the, life has taught us that. Life will teach you, if you're paying attention, that you cannot have happiness without any sadness. There's, there's just not a life that involves perfect, all-the-time happiness. So for a few minutes today, we're going to talk about Hobson's choices, demons, quantum physics, and decisions that we have to make. And we are going to do all that while Tommy Walker helps us start today. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. That place is called self-brain surgery. You can learn it, and it will help you become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And the good news is, you can start today. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, so glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get it done if you'd like the show. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell two or three friends this podcast was helpful to you, imagine how much good we can all do around the world together. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. Okay, so like I told you last night, that the Holy Spirit kind of ministered to me a little bit last night, uh, and I wrote about it in a email, the, the email that I sent to Lisa. I have this thing where the first email I send every morning is to Lisa every day um, for years now. I, I always try to give her the cream of the crop, the top of my thought process and creativity after I'm done with my Bible study, after I've spent my time with the Lord, the first human contact, human con- communication goes to Lisa. And so my email this morning I said, wow, God did some surgery on me last night. He said, this thing that happened, you feel bad about it. And it's it's the other person's fault. It's their fault. And you feel bad tonight because it's their fault. But if you still feel bad about it tomorrow, then it's going to be your fault. I, I felt that, friend. And I don't, I don't go around saying I heard God's voice out loud. I, I have once in my life, a couple of times in my life, heard an audible voice that I was that, that I was sure was the Lord. But I, I don't usually get that. It's more of a a subconscious thing, and I just somehow know. I think you know what I'm talking about. Just I just know that the Lord is telling me something. And last night it was that. It's it's this thing that happened is somebody else's fault, and that's why you feel bad. But if you still feel bad tomorrow, it's going to be your fault. Don't carry that into tomorrow. And here's another thing. Sometimes we let somebody else make us feel bad, and we use that to give us an excuse to to sin, basically. Drinkers and addicts are the worst at this. They're just plowing through their days looking for something to hurt them so they can justify to themselves drinking again or using again or gambling again or doing whatever again so that they can blame their behavior on somebody else's trouble. And so this the situation that we're dealing with, it, it's really... In the grand scheme of things, it's not that big of a deal, but it's it, it's a situation where a person who has always been, in my estimation, a, a real paragon of virtue, just, to, just somebody who does it right, somebody who advocates for doing the right thing, saying the right thing, telling the truth, all of that stuff, this person a- actually engaged in a very deceitful um so a deceitful behavior toward us to make us sort of think one thing when another thing was really happening. And, and like I said, it's, it's not a, 
it's not a big deal. It doesn't really change the dynamic of the the world or the universe isn't going to collapse or any of that stuff. But it's, but it was just crystal clear. This person, it's one of those times when you, you haven't ever really acknowledged to yourself that somebody's an actual human being. You've sort of deified them a little bit because you haven't seen them do that sort of stuff. And so when they do act like a normal person and, and act deceitful or, or be passive aggressive or have issues like that, it kind of takes you by surprise and it shocks you a little bit, right? This is one of the reasons why pastors who fall public Publicly, um, like the Ravi Zacharias situation last year, this is one of the reasons that that's so powerfully damaging to the kingdom is because we people forget that they're just people too, and we when they sin like we do, it 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 knocks us out, it nukes us. It shouldn't. It shouldn't surprise us when people act like people, right? But so this deal happened, and it was deceptive, and it was just. It wasn't even necessary. That's the thing. The situation we were involved in, the, the deceit didn't need to happen, and it just it just made us feel bad. Do you know what I mean? Like when somebody tells you a lie, and it's like, you didn't need to lie to me right then. I would, would have still done the right thing by you. You didn't have to fib to me. But still, anyway, when it happened, God just said, hey, it's their fault. But tomorrow, if you're still carrying it around, it's going to be your fault. You need to lay that down because people are people. People commit sins. People mess up. People let you down. And guess what? You do too. And don't ever be guilty of holding somebody else to a higher standard than that to which you would hold yourself, right? And then a second thing happened. I finally fell asleep about 1.30 or so this morning. And I had a dream about that passage in Mark 9 when Jesus was approached by the disciples and they were frustrated because they'd been trying to cast a demon out of this guy and they failed. And the disciples comes at Mark nine twenty eight. Later, he and the disciples gathered privately in a house and the disciples said, why couldn't we cast out that unclean spirit? And Jesus said, that sort of powerful spirit can only be conquered with much prayer and fasting. So Jesus said to the guys, to the, to the apostles, guys who had all of his power, he said, hey, sometimes you can't do something by yourself and you just have to pray about it. You got to let me take care of it. You got to let prayer take care of it. And so so I had this dream where that scene played out and I couldn't figure out exactly why I got that scene because I hadn't read that. Well, actually, I have read it. We've been reading the Bible in 90 days, so I did go through Mark recently, so it was in there subconsciously. But but I was thinking about this idea that there are some demons, some problems, some situations that you can't fix on your own, and you're supposed to pray about it. There's a passage in Luke 18, 1, where uh, Luke says, Jesus told his disciples a story to teach them that they should always pray and never give up. Now, there's an old uh, comedian back when I was a kid, a guy named Flip Wilson, brilliant comedian, African-American guy. And he always, his tagline was, the devil made me do it. He had this whole skit that he would say, oh, the devil made me do it. And and it was funny because sometime later, I don't know if it was him that said it or somebody was quoting him about that and wrote an article about the idea that don't blame the devil if you're an alcoholic, for example, if you drink again because you had booze in your cabinet, don't blame the devil if you're trying to lose weight, but you've got Cheetos in your pantry. Don't blame the devil if you make one click enabled on Amazon and you're a shopping addict and you make it super easy for you to go and spend a bunch of money when you're feeling bad for retail therapy. Don't blame the devil if you downloaded that porn onto your computer. Don't blame him for stuff that you're doing, right? Don't blame him. So I was thinking about Flip Wilson saying the devil made me do it. I was thinking about how people sometimes succumb to the problems that they have because they fail to clean up their mess. So, yes, you can be tempted by the devil, but if you have enabled him to do so by putting stuff in your house or in your heart or on your computer that you ought not to have there, you should be looking more in the mirror than into the spiritual realm for why you're struggling with those problems, right? So uh, here's these competing thoughts. I've got this, this situation where somebody's let me down and I'm struggling with it and God says, hey, Lee, put that down. Yes, it's their fault. Yes, you feel bad. It's reasonable to feel bad. Put it down and don't carry it into tomorrow. Okay, and then there's some other stuff going on in your life, and somebody that's listening to me right now, there's something going on in your life that you have been blaming other people, your ex, your job, your boss, the devil. You've been blaming somebody else, 2020, coronavirus, the the stress of the pandemic, whatever. You've been blaming that, and the fact is you still have Coors Light in your refrigerator, and that's why you give into it. 
because you haven't taken the step that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 5. There's a verse in Matthew 5.30 when Jesus says, hey, if your hand, even if it's your dominant hand, makes you sin, then cut it off and throw it away. Jesus is saying it's better for you to take decisive surgical action to get rid of the things, people, situations, places, habits, everything in your life that will cause you trouble. Get rid of it. Cast it away. It's better for you to do without it than to give into it if that thing thing is a problem for you okay so i'm trying really hard to tie these two ideas together god said you got a problem that's not your fault tonight but it will be your fault if you carry it into tomorrow or if you let it convince you that that you can justify doing something that's going to make you feel even worse tomorrow right and then the second idea that sometimes we have demons problems situations that we can't fix on our own And Jesus says the solution to those things is to pray about them. So how do you keep from somebody else's problem, how do you keep that from carrying it into becoming your problem tomorrow? And how do you keep from taking a problem that you do have and blaming somebody else for carrying it into another day and further down your life? How do you deal with the fact that those issues in our lives cannot always be gotten rid of? The way you deal with them is you pray. You, you meditate, you fast, you think about your thinking, and you rearrange your head on the situation. And if you got to cut your hand off, cut your hand off. That's not a medical, I'm not giving you medical advice to go chop your hand off. Don't do that. It's a metaphor, okay? <laughs> if you're listening to me and you got the cleaver out, you're about to chop your hand off, don't do it. Go get psychiatric help. It's a metaphor. Chop the things out of your life that ought not to be there. Now, let's go back to quantum physics and let's go back to Hobson's choices for a second. In this world, we are ruled by the in the thing in the realm of the things that we can see. We're ruled by what's called classical physics. Okay, in classical physics, there's a whole set of equations that model behavior of what we expect to see if we, for example, throw a ball up into the air. What's going to happen? It's going to follow a parabolic path and it's going to come back down to Earth because gravity is going to pull it back down to Earth at a measurable and set speed. Okay, when you drop an object, it's going to fall at a predictable rate, right? And it's going to fall. It would freak you out if tomorrow you dropped a ball and it went up, right? That's classical physics. And we get used to the world operating like we think it's going to operate. So in our worldview, for example, we think that if we're a good person and we work hard and we do everything right and we focus on our family and take good care of our kids, that everybody will be happy and things will go well for us. But what happens in the real world? It doesn't operate according to classical physics. We can do everything right and we can still get a glioblastoma. We can do everything right and get that phone call still that our 19-year-old son has died. Our wife can leave us. The bank can foreclose on us. The market can collapse. The wrong guy can get elected. The be- you know Stuff can happen that you didn't expect to happen. and You think it's impossible because you are operating with one set of rules in your mind classical physics, for example, but the world is a quantum world. What do I mean by that? If you haven't heard this before, if you haven't been listening lately or you haven't read my book, quantum physics is, is the subatomic, the small things, how, how the nuclei and the atoms in the world behave. And when those guys, the physicists in the, in the early 1900s were trying to figure out how to make atom bombs and things like that, and we're glad they did, not because there's an atom bomb, but we're glad that they figured out quantum physics because that's how we have internet and computers and space travel and, and microwave ovens and televisions and all that stuff that all that math that creates all that stuff came from quantum physics so when they were trying to figure out they realized pretty quickly that small particles moving close to the speed of light don't behave according to the mathematics that large particles like balls falling behave at And what they figured out is that there's weird things that happen at the quantum level, like an electron can basically be in two places at once. So that's impossible for me to be in two places at once, right? But an electron can be, or at least when you try to model its behavior mathematically, that's what basically you have to account for is it essentially can be in two places at once. And so God showed me last night something about Mitch, my son. And, you know, I'm always telling you, hey, John 16, 33 tells us that we're going to, that God wants us to have peace, even though we're going to have hard things. He wants us to have abundance, even though we're going to have hard things. And I still every day cry about my son. I still every day have some moment where I stutter in my breath and I just, and I'm just really mad that he's not here. And, you know, 
last week um, was the anniversary of the death of the brother of one of my dear friends. And, and uh, I didn't realize it till I just saw it on a calendar just now. And I didn't tell her that, but I know that years later after losing her brother, she still feels it every day. I, I feel it every day, losing my son. And the fact is there's never going to be a day when he's not gone. And I don't feel that. Okay. So what God said last night is Lee, you, you need to take this teaching to another level. You need to help people understand something on a deeper level. Yes, life is hard. And yes, you have to accept that it's a Hobson's choice, but there's quantum physics applied here because my promises are all true all the time. And so the fact is that the worst day of my life, August 20th, 2013, the day my son was brutally killed, was also the best day of his life because shortly after that occurred, he looked into the face of the Prince of Peace and he heard, well done, my good and faithful servant. And he achieved the destiny for which he was created on that day. On the worst day for me, it was the best day for him. He was in those two places, the the bucket of the worst and the bucket of the best at the very same time because that is because we have a quantum God. We don't have a God that's bound by space or time, and that's why he can make an axe head float and why he can create photons and light and he can call the world into existence and he can raise the dead and he can break chains and he can make a way where there is no way for you because he is a quantum God. And so it's, an, it, it's a Hobson's choice. I can believe that Mitch's dying was horrible and that it was the best thing ever for him and that Romans 8:28 is really true that God can make something good out of it because if you're hearing this right now and your life is in trouble and you're finding some kind of hope because of what I'm saying into this microphone in Nebraska in the United States then the fact is that I'm speaking these words because I lost my son and that's what motivated me to get this out there and do this thing and so he would be happy to know that us losing him motivated us to do something to try to help other people. And if you're benefited by this, please let me know because you're proving the point that yes, life is a Hobson's choice and Mitch's dying was worse and the best at the same time and that God kept his promise that all things will work together for some good for those that love the Lord. I can believe that or here's the other choice. And this is your choice today, friend. I can believe all those things and I can, I can somehow manage to find joy and purpose and meaning in my life despite the hard things. Or I can wallow in misery and sorrow for the rest of my days as a bereaved dad. I could say, you know what? I'm going to be in a support group every week. I'm going to drink too much. I'm probably going to lose my wife. I'm just going to sit in this pain and I'm going to roll in it and I'm going to bathe myself in it and I'm going to stay there in that role of a bereaved father for the rest of my life and that's what's going to happen. I could do that if I couldn't accept the Hobson's choice. I would do that if I couldn't accept the Hobson's choice. The Hobson's choice is, yes, that hard thing happened. Yes, you can have joy and meaning and purpose in your life anyway. And I need to settle that. And that's why I'm talking to you today. Because today, I want you to settle some Hobson's choices in your life. There's a verse in Hebrews chapter 12 that starts 1 through 4. And it goes like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You see that, friend? It's a Hobson's choice. People are going to sometimes deceive you. They're going to lie to you. They're going to mistreat you, leave you. They're going to not come back when you apologize. You're going to do something to break a relationship, and they're not going to give you mercy. They're going to hold you to a higher standard than they hold themselves. It's going to happen. All those things are going to happen to you, but it's unlikely, the writer says, that they're going to crucify you over it like they did Jesus. It's unlikely that you're going to shed blood over it. So the one and only point that I'm trying to make to you today, friend, is this. There are some things that you need to settle in your mind and in your heart if you're going to be happy. What are those for you? You should write them down. If there's some things that you're going to have to accept at some point, yes, I had, I lost my leg due to diabetes and I'm going to not have two legs for the rest of my life. You're going to have to settle that because it's true. 
Or, yes, I lost my spouse because I was unfaithful and they wouldn't forgive me, and I'm going to have to accept that. Or, yes, my son died. Yes, I have a brain tumor. Yes, I X, Y, Z. Whatever it is, if it's something that God has put in your heart and your life that's a thorn in the flesh or some situation that is true and is not going to change or you haven't seen how it could change yet, God is still calling you to be able to find joy, meaning, abundance, and purpose in it. Remember Victor Frankl said from a concentration camp, you wrote, that it is suffering that ceases to be suffering when it finds context and purpose in your life. So if you want to understand how Jesus could be called a man of sorrows, but also be such a magnetic, joyful, charismatic character that he's still the most popular human that's ever lived on the earth, it's because he understood the Hobson's choice of, yes, life is hard, but yes, God is good, and yes, you can have pain, but yes, you must have joy. Why must we have joy? It's not because he wants us to be um, Pollyannas. It's because joyful people can help other people find hope when they're hurting, and joyful people can help other people find their path to the kingdom so they can find what real joy and purpose and meaning are about. So start praying for peace around these things. Write them down. What are those Hobson's choices that you need to settle and accept in your life today? Write them down. Pray for peace over them. Pray that they'll break generational curses and you won't carry that into your next, that you teach your kids to be, you know, miserable people who grovel in their misery when something bad happens to them. Teach your kids to have joy and purpose anyway when they're having hard things. So start clarifying the true things in your life and disavow yourself from the notion that you need to have a pain-free life in order to be happy. That is not true. You should be able to be happy and find purpose in spite of the hard things in life. And let me tell you this principle the degree to which you couple emotion and circumstance in your life is inversely proportional to your ability to be happy. You must divorce. You must uncouple emotion and circumstance. Bad things can happen. You can still be happy. Bad things, hard things, difficult things, sad things, devastating things can happen, and you can still find joy, meaning, purpose, and abundance in your life because Jesus said that you could. And he further said That's why I came. That's why I was here. What kills us is the unwillingness to accept the quantum duality that life is hard, but we can be happy anyway. We focus on the but and the and and the woe and the oh no, and we forget Habakkuk's though and yet, right? Though there's no figs, yet I'm going to still be happy. Though there's no sheep, yet I'm still going to be happy. Though there's no cattle, yet I'm going to still be happy. Habakkuk says, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to count on him. I'm going to believe in him. I'm going to let him be my enough. I'm going to let him fill me up. I am not going to let the hard times in this world keep me from finding joy. My friend, if you can accept those Hobson's choices and allow them to be true, but still be able to accept Jesus' promise that he came for you to be happy and at peace anyway, you, my friend, will change your mind and change your life. And so I am a bereaved father. God is not going to give me my son back. I have settled that. And yes, I did pray that he would be raised from the dead. I think every bereaved parent does that. Bring him back. Make this just a dream. Make it not true. Let him come back. And remember I told you in the last episode about General Buford at Gettysburg. Buford sat up on the top of that hill. And in Michael Sherrod's book, he talks about how Buford saw the vision of the coming battle. And he said, as if it were already done and a memory already, an odd set stony quality to it as if tomorrow had already occurred and there was nothing you could do about it the way sometimes you feel before a foolish attack, knowing it's going to fail, but you can't stop it or run away and you even have to take part of it in it and help it fail. So Buford's like that. He's telling us something that happens to us all the time. My example is I could speak life into my grief as a bereaved father, and I could say, you know what? It's just inevitable. I've lost my child, so therefore the rest of my life has to be terrible. Therefore, I'll end up divorced, so I won't be able to take care of my family. I'm going to drink too much. I'm going to gain weight. I'm going to be crushed in my spirit. I'm just going to be a loser because I won't be able to overcome this. And I could have spoken life into that grief, made it inevitable like Buford's vision, or I could accept the Hobson's choice and decide that God had placed me here and now to learn to help others through this and speak life into his promise that he would be close to me, Psalm 34, 18, that somehow good would come from this, Romans 8, 28. And he ministered to me that the horrible day for me was a perfect day for Mitch, a quantum reality snatched from a classical impossibility. 
So friend, write down some Hobson's choices and deal with them. Do some brain surgery on yourself and deal with them and give them to God and say, God, if you're asking me to walk this road, then walk with me. Keep your promises. Help me see the light again. Friend, this will give you power over the problem and it will bring order for you in the chaos. If you settle those Hobson's choices, that is how you will change your mind. That is how you will change your life. And that is how you will become healthier, feel better, and be happier. But you can only do it if you start today. Hey, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And if you like the show, you'll love my weekly letter. Check out my writing at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. Get the free newsletter every week for my best prescriptions for becoming healthier, feeling better, and being happier through the power of faith and neuroscience smashing together via self-brain surgery, drleewarren.substack.com. And if you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at wleewarrenmd.com slash prayer. The theme music for the show is Make Us One by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by the great folks over at tommywalkerministries.org. Check it out and consider supporting them, tommywalkerministries.org. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you, friend. Have a great day.